Hi all, and welcome to the Medical AI Lab talk series. I'm delighted that today we have Brian Gopal presenting PyTorch Lightning. Uh, looking forward to your talk, Brian, take it away. Thanks, Pranav. Um, let me just share my screen. Um, so yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Brian, and today I'll be giving a tutorial on PyTorch Lightning, um, which is a framework for scaling up your machine learning and deep learning pipelines. So. As a brief motivation for why you might want to use PyTorch Lightning, I want to go over what a traditional machine learning code base would look like. So this can be with any library, any language, but you can almost very cleanly break it up into three main components. The first component is, is your data, which handles the loading and pre-processing of your raw, your, your raw files. Um, breaks it up into training, validation, and test splits, and adds augmentations. Basically anything that takes like raw data in whatever form and makes it, it transforms it into something that a machine learning system can train on. And the next component of these code bases are the systems themselves. So that would be your model architecture, your loss function, and anything inside your training and validation loops. And all of this is meant to basically train a model from scratch into something that you can use downstream for testing. And the final part and the part that is often overlooked is the infrastructure that ties the data and system all together. So that would be your data loading, your batching, your optimizer steps, the backward calls, all of the tiny pieces of boilerplate code that, that take a machine learning system and the data code and make it all work together. And you may not notice it because it's so interspersed with all of the rest of your code, but this infrastructure code can get unwieldy very fast, especially if you're trying to iterate on it. So you can imagine if, if this is infrastructure code for just data loading, optimizer steps, and backward calls. If you want to add to this, let's say you want to add learning rate scheduling. That's a little bit more code that you have to make sure is compatible with everything else you've written. Um, let's say you want to do gradient accumulation and mixed precision. That's a little bit more code on top of that. And if you want to add multi-GPU training, that's a lot more code that basically requires you to make sure all of your previous infrastructure developments are not going to conflict with this new feature that you're trying to add. And I make the argument that building infrastructure consumes valuable research time. So it requires you to learn lots of esoteric knowledge on the fly. And it's not really related to the research that you're trying to do most of the time. And it creates a lot of surface area for errors, which means your pipelines may not be reproducible to someone trying to re-implement your paper. And that's where I think PyTorch Lightning comes in because it decouples the components of machine learning code bases and handles all of the almost all of the infrastructure on its own backend. And it does so by leveraging three main abstractions for the three components of machine learning code. So for the data code, you have the lightning data module. For the system, you have the lightning module. And for the infrastructure, you have the training, the trainer. And this trainer takes a bunch of flags that specify whatever infrastructure you want at runtime. So rather than going through the documentation, I think it's probably better to tackle a basic use case of PyTorch Lightning, which is MNIST classification. Now, I'll talk about some extensions later and how this may be good for your use case, but just to make things simple, we'll stick with this. So the first component of, of uh, building a Lightning code base is using a Lightning data module. So I have, let me just switch to my laser pointer really quickly. But so for this lightning data module, you want to, you want to subclass a, the PyTorch lightning interface for a lightning data module. And in this, you want to override a few functions in order to allow lightning to handle your data code on its backend. So the first one's obviously a constructor, nothing too, uh, nothing too complex here, except for the save hyperparameters flag, which is really a convenience function that saves all of your data module hyperparameters like batch size or number of workers into a namespace so you don't have to assign attributes by yourself. Um, the next function that you're gonna wanna override is the prepare data function, which is meant to download any data sets but not assign state to anything. So you're not gonna do like self.train equals MNIST, you're just going to do whatever downloading you need to do. Um, then the main cross of any 
example is your setup function, which messes up the actual data sets to attributes that you can use for data loading. It takes as input a stage, which is an optional string denoting which data sets you want to load. If you don't pass this in, you'll just load everything. So in, in the case where your stage is fit, you want to load your train and validation sets. You can simply do so in this case by loading the MNIST data set and doing a random split, pretty self-explanatory. And, and similarly for the test case, you're just going to load the test data set using this MNIST tra uh, train, uh, train flag set to false. So once that's done, you have to create a way for the system to get access to data loaders for, its into, for, its for the training and validation loops. You do so using um, the train data loader, val data loader, and test data loader methods, which simply return wrap data loaders on your data sets using a bat with a batch size that you, you would have specified in that hyperparameters dictionary that you passed in at the beginning of the data module. So this handles all of your data code within one class. All of the backend stuff for like moving for data loading like moving stuff onto and off of GPUs and everything like that is handled by Lightning on its own. And so it provides a really nice way to encapsulate all of the relevant code for your data set in a single class. Now for the system itself, you're going to want to similarly subclass something called a Lightning module. Now this has a lot more hooks that you can, you can override to allow really fine grained access into your training loop but I'm just gonna talk about a really simple use case. So like the, like the lightning data module before it, you have a hyperparameters dictionary, which you can just save really quickly. And, you, and lightning really wants you to think about these lightning modules as a system itself. It's not just the metric, it's not just the module, it's also the metrics, the logging, everything that you need to create an, an encapsulated system that you can monitor. And so in that, in that spirit, we're gonna define a metric. Um, using, we'll just call, we'll just define the accuracy metric from this other library, Torch Metrics. Um, if you don't, if you're not familiar with this, you don't really need to be. Um, you, you'll see how it works as we go. But we're just going to define this metric and then also define a simple network. Um, this is a three layer neural network, nothing too, nothing too crazy. Um, but one thing you'll want to notice here is that the only reliance that this classifier has on whatever data set you're using is specified by this hyperparameters dictionary. So you can, you can really make these components interoperable with each other just by passing in different hyperparameters. And we'll get, to, we'll get to what that means later, but basically we can leverage this hyperparameters dictionary to create a classifier almost on the fly. Now, once we once you've defined all of our uh, once we've defined everything in our lightning module, we want to set up the training loop, and we do that by overriding three main functions. The first is the forward function, which which passes a tensor through the network just by passing in the flattened image. In this case, for MNIST, um, and then once we've done that we just have to override two more functions. The first is the training step, which defines everything inside the training loop. And it's expected to return a loss given a batch. So we're just gonna do that here. We'll, we'll break up the batch and then compute the cross entropy loss after passing the input through the forward function. And once we're done, we just have to define the optimization and the scheduling for, for this system. And we do so by overriding the configure optimizers flag. There's a lot of ways you can you can specify your optimization schedules. Um, you can specify one optimizer, multiple optimizers, optimizers and schedulers, a bunch of different things. But in this case, we're going to stick to a simple atom optimizer using the learning rate that you passed in through that dictionary, and a, and a cosine annealing learning rate scheduler. Um, we're going to return those two in this format, so Lightning knows that we're getting an optimizer and a scheduler. And that is all of the training, take, the training loop taken care of in not that much code. Finally, we want to evaluate the, uh, the, the system at every epoch. So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna define the validation steps and the testing steps. They're, they're, they're identical, so we're, we'll just override it with a shared function, with, with, which is called shared eval step. So in this shared eval step, what you want to do is just do whatever logging you need to do in order to monitor your system effectively. So 
In this case, we'll just take the batch compute a loss as before, but we'll also update our metric internally using the logits that's produced by this model. So what that does is it allows us to keep a running validation accuracy. So at the end of each, every epoch, you'll have a full epoch level accuracy that you can then log using the shared eval epoch end method. So Lightning has an internal logger that you can just call with self.log and it will, it will log it for you automatically and you can view it using TensorBoard as you would. So because after this, we'll just define validation step, test step, validation epoch end, and test epoch end to call the respective shared methods. And once we're done, this automatically keeps track of all of the metrics as we're going. So we can checkpoint on it, do early stopping, whatever we want. And that takes care of both the system and data code. Now, finally, I want to talk about the infrastructure. And that's all managed in, what, in, a, in the trainer class. So this is what a full, like, run function would look like using PyTorch Lightning. So it takes the respective hyperparameters for each of the data module and the systems, passes them in, and then it takes the dictionary containing a bunch of flags that you want. And you can just pass this into the trainer and then call fit to fit the model on the training and validation data and then test it using the best checkpoint path that it will automatically determine. And that's about it. So as for what flags you want, there's a ton. I'll show you a few that I like to use. So the first is GPUs, which is which I set here to negative one, which is a sentinel value letting Lightning know to take all available GPUs that it can see. And if it's if that number is greater than one, it will automatically set up multi-GPU training. And you don't have you, and in most cases you won't have to worry about the back end and anything else that, that's related to that. Um, for I if you want to set the cap on training, max epox is a good way to go. Um, for research purposes, I, I like to set deterministic to true so you can ensure that your results are reproducible if you duplicate them, um, if you duplicate a run. Um, detect anomaly is really useful for terminating on NAND losses. And Lightning also has a really good way to implement, a really good way to implement callbacks. So if you want to inject some code to inspect the system at runtime without be, with, while being still system agnostic, you can you can use you can use Lightning's callback you can use Lightning's default callbacks or implement one of your own. So in this case, I'm using early stopping, which which stops if the validation loss has not decreased for 30 epochs. And similarly, I'll use model checkpoint to checkpoint the best best model with the lowest validation loss. You, if you want to enable mixed precision training, you can do so just by setting the precision to five to 16. If you want to do gradient clipping, you can. In this case, I don't. If you want to resume from checkpoint, if your job got crashed, if your job crashed or whatever, you can just use the checkpoint that Lightning saves for you, and it will resume as if nothing happened. Um, and if you want to do gradient accumulation, you can just pass in a number of batches that you want to do, and Lightning will do this all for you. This is a lot of code compression and takes care of building out and gives you a lot of features out of the box just with single lines of code. And finally, I wanted to, I want to mention something that I alluded to earlier, which is the interoperability of component modules. So in this setup with PyTorch Lightning, almost all of the interaction between different components are handled by these hyperparameter dictionaries that you pass in. So the MNIST data module intrinsically is not really dependent on the classifier module and vice versa. So this allows for a lot of cool code sharing. For example, if you didn't want to build a classifier on the MNIST data module, you could build one on the Checkspert data module, as long as you update your hyperparameters. Um, if you don't want to build a classifier for the MNIST data module, you can build a conditional GAN for the MNIST module. Uh, so as long as you're updating whatever configurations that you need, which you would do anyways, you can do, you can do a lot of code sharing and get, up, get, up and get off the ground with a new system or a new data module very, very quickly. And finally, I want to talk about some extensions that you can use for your specific use case. So there's a few things that you can do. And the first one is you can override way more Lightning module hooks. So Lightning actually has a way for you to inject code at any single point in the training pipeline almost um, before and after any event happens. So this could be device transfer onto uh, transfer of a batch onto the GPU before and after. You can have custom backward functions, multiple optimizers, a bunch of things. Uh, recommend checking out the documentation for that. Um, and finally, if you want to have system agnostic ways to inspect your code, you could implement callback classes. Finally, if you want to have different infrastructure, you can obviously specify more or different flags to the trainer.
So, yep, that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Brian.